Good evening, everyone. Welcome. My name is Emmanuel Masu. Um, I will begin uh, with the Lenape land acknowledgement. Tonight, we gather in the Lenape Hoking, the unceded ancestral homeland of the Lenape peoples. I ask you to join me in acknowledging the Lenape community, their traditional territory, elders, ancestors, and future generations and in acknowledging as a school that Columbia, like New York City and the United States as a nation was founded upon the exclusions and erasures of many indigenous peoples. GSAP is committed to addressing the deep history of erasure of indigenous knowledge and professions of the built environment generally and in Western traditional architectural education specifically. With this, GSAP commits to confronting these institutional legacies as agents of colonialism and to honoring indigenous knowledge in this curricula. In summer 2020, at the peak of the global uprising led by the Movement for Black Lives, in a period of extreme isolation intensified by the global pandemic, Thandi Lowenson, Susie Hall, and Huda Tayob came together to imagine and assemble an open access curriculum, a gathering of films, images, text, an iterative platform that invites us to think and learn together. It is a project that meditates on the aesthetics of unlearning unlearning the innocence of architecture by tracing its various histories of displacement and containment. In his recent book, Beyond Aesthetics, Wole Soinka writes, and I quote, the objective of art is thus, among other purposes, revelation. This includes revelations of what is not. Whether revelation leads to social transformation or not, is a different issue, end quote. Similarly, I would argue that race, space, and architecture's objective is revelation. Thus, when I first came across it, I read it not only as a pedagogical project, but as a project that helps us understand what architecture is not. Architecture has rare, rarely been what it claims to be, universal, autonomous, neutral, or objective. Its place-making ambitions are always already entangled with race-making practices. Spatializing strategies are compromised by racializing logics. But what race, space, and architecture also teaches us is that architecture is not reducible to these logics. Its commitment to the spatial realm helps us think with and about everyday practices of resistance. The bodily and material practices that incessantly chip at the edges and foundations of racial capital. Susie, Huda, and Thandi, along with their long list of interlocutors, offer six frames, centralizing, circulating, domesticating, extracting, immobilizing, and incarcerating. Implicating our discipline and forcing us to look at what we do and make as experts of the built environment. It is not a retreat, but a confrontation with the most banal forms of violence embedded in our drawings and images. The spaces and people we have been taught to measure and mismeasure, center and marginalize. I like the fact that it is incomplete. The fact that this open access curriculum can expand in multiple directions, dimensions, platforms and geographies, simultaneously giving us a sharper and more generous understanding of our institutional and disciplinary limits. But maybe what I appreciate most about race space and architecture is its suspicion of architects as experts. It suggests that architects do not understand what the spatialization of race or the racialization of space produces. This claim is made evident by juxtaposing the production of architects with the production of poets, filmmakers, musicians, and writers. When I met with them last fall, they told me that the project 
is about having all the optimism about change and dealing with the knowledge that not enough change is happening. I am deeply inspired by the work that Susie Hall, Huda Tayob, and Thandi Lowenson do as individuals and as founders of race, space, and architecture. Tonight's lecture will include films, sound pieces, and provocations, thinking about education, subjectivity, and discipline. Most importantly, for a school committed to thinking about the built environment, there will be questions about the practices and structures that are perpetually limiting the radical reimagination of architectural education. Please join me in welcoming Susie Hall, Huda Tayeb, and Thandi Lowenson. Hello, Columbia. We are really pleased to be able to talk with you today. My name is Susie Hall, and I want to start by extending our warm thanks to Kane for the AV, to Lucy and Stefan for inviting us to participate in your lecture series, and of course to Emmanuel for his incredibly generous introduction, but also for the wonderful rich conversation that we had late last year about the possibilities of shaping our learning in architecture differently. In the spirit of collaboration, Huda, Tandi and I are all going to have a chance to speak with you in different ways. But my task today is to begin with the question of what do we imagine a curriculum in race, space and architecture to be? And I want to start by rewinding a little, um, just to say that we started our project, in fact, in 2018, with no hint of a curriculum in mind. Um, at that stage, Huda and I were meeting uh, each week to, to read and to talk together, but initially with a focus on race and space with respect to migration and borders. Um, at the same time, Huda and Tandi and a group of fellow travelers were uh, teaching and studying in architectural institutions, um, but were also meeting together to read, to shape workshops and exhibitions around coloniality, decolonization, and the cultural life of political blackness. Our early conversations were really imbued with, with many frustrations of learning and teaching within university environments, which are invariably um, shaped by the overlaps of hierarchies, disciplinary boundaries, and of course, casualizations all of which suffocate the possibilities of, of really trying to imagine um, social justice as central to pedagogy. So outside of the university space, we were incredibly enthused and motivated and uplifted by an array of imaginative energies forged around questions of learning differently together. From the fees must fall movement to projects like the Funambulist and the Chimbaranga Chronic. And so we gradually came to the question, how do we learn about architecture in the enduring context of racial capitalism? So I think this is really about asking what we imagine a curriculum to be that connects the discipline or the disciplining of architecture to the undisciplining of architectural practice. And this is certainly not to suggest that disciplining and undisciplining are separate or even oppositional. But it is to say that if architecture is a varied practice that imagines, builds, and therefore validates a design world, then how do we consciously shape our practice to recognize racial injustice? And moreover, how do we engage with the audacious practices of refusal that are not captive to the shackles of racial domination and violence. And so our curriculum begins um, with three questions that we raise up front. And I, and I want to read these questions out to you. The first is, what are the spatial contours of capitalism that produce race, racial hierarchy and injustice? Secondly, what are the inventive repertoires of refusal and remaking that are neither reduced to nor exhausted by racial capitalism and how are they spatialized? And thirdly, 
How is race configured differently across space? And how can an entangled and expansive world space broaden our imaginations for teaching and learning? We locate the nexus of space and race in relation to the durable lineage of coloniality and extraction, um, as well as the more recent configurations of sovereign powers and the marketization of just about everything. In our curriculum, this means seeing the design of the plantation in relation to the design of the jail and to connect the designed rectilinear constrictions of the human in the bellows of the slave ship to the blueprints for the mine hostels of Johannesburg to the labor camps of Qatar, to the migrant deportation camps of Europe. In finding the different themes and forms for our curriculum, um, we follow the legendary Ruth Wilson Gilmore's prompt of what are the different routes to consciousness. And tonight, I just briefly want to articulate or touch on three of these. One route is the multivocal. And this compels us to think with the wide circuits of experience and understanding that requires us to decenter the presumed authority of whiteness and at the same time to decenter the self possessed subject as the authorized expert. But I think it very much also requires us to extend um, beyond a Euro American knowledge formation. And so in our curriculum, we still need to reflect very much on, on how we encompass these wider circuits through exploring what it would mean to engage with more voices outside of the university space. And I think that's, that's a challenge that we still need to attend to. Um, another route is the multimodal, where we engage um, the significantly different forms of understanding and representation by thinking with drawings, films, music, books, articles, and web platforms. I think what we've been most interested in is a range of experiments and authorships, many of which come from students and some of which come from particularly commissioned work, which some of which we're going to share with you tonight. And then I would say our third route is to think through the possibilities of demarketizing the curriculum. And this is about thinking about how to retain and respect an open access. Um, in part, this has been about trading um, in collegial favors and solidarities. It's by calling on interdisciplinary interpretations of race, space and architecture that certainly requires expansive imaginations, but not expansive budgets. And so before I hand over um, to Huda, I want to just say that Really, our curriculum is, is work in progress. It began as a set of conversations in very small circles. It was sustained by regularly meeting and talking over shared frustrations, but also optimistic commitments. And then it gradually expanded through workshops with colleagues and wider publics. So the curriculum has also shifted shape from these very early forms to a a fairly straightforward downloadable PDF that imagined a way of convening our ideas through the six themes that Emmanuel mentioned, but which then transitioned to a website that could host many more interpretations. And so the question that we've been asking ourselves in the past months is what's next? And uh, uh, this is a, a question we would really hope to engage you in um, with us tonight. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Susie. Um, thanks to all the, to, to the organizers um, and everyone who's made this possible and to Emmanuel for your really beautiful introduction. So I want to follow on from Susie and reflect a bit on the framework and structures um, within the curriculum uh, and the structuring of the curriculum. Race, space and architecture is a project that questions what architecture is and what it might be. It is a methodological intervention and an epistemological provocation. It is a project that assembles an archive around six key frames as a starting point to question the relationship between race making and space making. If race making is configured in processes of displacement and emplacement, 
then the curriculum must extend to the unspectacular spatial practices necessitated by living with very little, to the extreme spatialities of banishment and punishment, to practices of resistance, refusal, joy and care. Precarity and possibility are not exclusive. And so in working through the framework and structure, we ask the following questions in particular. Which vocabularies are able to respond to the vast extent of racial dehumanization across the spaces of body, nation, and planet, and to the reconstitutions of a humanity that speak to a shared planetary future? And what countermappings might allow us to push for wider, alternative, and multiple forms of knowledge and understanding? The six frames allow us to draw out specific processes of racialization as they cohere in spatial processes and the spatial typologies and built forms in and through which they are sustained and transgressed. The six frames, as you've heard, are centralizing, circulating, domesticating, extracting, immobilizing and incarcerating. Each frame in turn contains a series of subframings of spatial processes, along with a set of spatial typologies. So for example, in, in the section on domesticating, we include as, a, as the subframings, suburbanizing, compounding, homemaking, ghettoizing, squatting, gendering, and redlining, along with the spatial typologies of the suburban house, the migrant hostel, the home place, the ghetto, favela, township, gated enclave, village, and Bantustan. Each section aims to bring together a range of geographies to consider very different situations and locations as being in conversation. To start with a spatial process as a verb is to emphasize that racial ordering does not end with colonialism or slavery, but is repeated and maintained into the present. Such ordering is not arbitrary nor incidental. It operates at the level of the raced body, but also decisively at the level of structures that following Christina Sharp define the raced body as constitutively outside. To list these spatial processes, typologies and worlds is to trace the accumulation of embodied detritus of race making and space making. This in itself is a methodological position to draw on Edouard Glissant, where the open-ended lists draw attention to an excess of specificities, read with other similar spaces, always in relation. None of the frames and associated lists are in any way definitive or complete. Many of the framings overlap, and certainly they omit. They are countless, and yet precise and specific. In the abundance of the specificities, each framework helps us to think about particular arrangements of political and economic power, arrays that move from the intimate to the national and global and back. Through the frameworks and processes of listing, there is a continuous circling and return, a continued building up of volume, the accumulation of framings which speak to each other enables a recognition of the multiplicities and complexities and an attendance to their opacities, to not flatten or generalize and to remain with and work through an understanding that this work is often within a language and grammar that is always complicit, that is always complicit and captured, marked by conquest, yet also by transgress, transgression. So to offer an example from the, um, of some material from the curriculum, I want to briefly speak to two forms which are present in the curriculum and which I have written about elsewhere, namely La Noire de and Come Back Africa. As we write in the curriculum, domesticating is necessarily cited within, um, in the section on domesticating. Domesticating is necessarily cited within larger processes of land expropriation the economies of home and practices of displacement across time. Yet we also recognize that despite imposed structures of racial capital, complex realities are negotiated through enduring forms of intimacy and sustenance. Mm -hmm. 
La Noire de, which you're seeing a clip of, is a 1966 film which traces the life of Duana, a young Senegalese, a young Senegalese woman from Dakar, Senegal, who travels to Marseille, um, to Antibes, France, for work. In the opening scenes of the film, we arrive with Duana at the port of Marseille. We first, we first see and hear a large steamship as it glides inside the sea wall, sounding its horn. And then the daily workings of the busy port as the bustle of passengers disembark, gather bags, greet families, against the backdrop of cranes, railway tracks and cargo containers. Joanna has come to work as a live-in nanny for a French family that had already employed her to look after their children when they lived in suburban Dakar. Although the film begins with Joanna's arrival in France, the plot travels back and forth in time and space between her tragic present, where she has been tricked into domestic slavery in Antibes and is effectively imprisoned in um, the apartment she works in, and the life in Dakar she left behind. Est-ce que quelqu'un est venu m'attendre? So while in Antibes, Joanna, où vas-tu? Chercher du travail. C'est ce matin-là que tout commença. C'était à Dakar. While in Antibes, we only see her within the apartment beyond the first scene at the port. In Dakar, we travel with Joanna through the city, from her mother's home in the Medina to the city centre and white suburbs. The film presents a narrative and visual structure through which Semben captures the racialized inequalities, injustices and segregation, even as these boundaries of enclosure are crossed. In centering the film on Duana, a domestic worker, Sembene is asking us here to pay attention to those who clean and care, to the production of domestic space and the work of social reproduction. Yet this is a domesticity which cannot be isolated. Every time Duana moves between worlds, she must cross the single footbridge spanning the railway tracks that keep the native quarter conveniently isolated. This narrative technique draws attention to enduring coloniality and ongoing associations across distances through a gendered, classed and racialized reading of domestic and infrastructural space. La Noire de can be read as an embodied archive and a spatial critique that asks us to think of architecture in terms of the entangled colonial and neo-colonial relationships it houses. This is not only evident in the relationship between Dakar's Medina and the settler city, but also in the sustained inequality of the power dynamic between colony and metropole, between south and north. While La Noire de is ultimately a tragedy, certain moments clearly position Joanna as a subject, engaging with the city on her own terms. Perhaps Simbin is alluding to what might have seemed possible at this particular early post-colonial moment. Through the lens of Frantz Fanon's writing, I suggest we may look at Antibes and Dakar as historically constituted and defined, as sites of racialized violence, resistance and refusal. Come back Africa, a bit closer to home for me, is the second film that was released six years earlier in March 1960. It was banned almost immediately on its release in many parts of the world. 
The film nevertheless became central in generating support for the resistance to apartheid internationally, particularly following the Sharpeville massacre of 1960, the anniversary of which was commemorated earlier this week on the 21st of March. Come Back Africa was a collaborative project between two established Sophia Town intellectuals and writers, Louis Nkosi and William Bloke Modisane, and the American filmmaker Lionel Rogosin. Set in Johannesburg and filmed on the, under the guise of a music documentary. In the film, we journey through Johannesburg with Zachariah, a migrant laborer who has left his rural home in search for work in the city. We travel through the mines, migrant hostels, a hotel, suburban apartments, the central city, and importantly, to Sophia Town, an area of Johannesburg well known for its cosmopolitan jazz culture. And at the time of filming, in the process of being demolished under the Group Areas Act and Natives Resettlement Act, two apartheid laws, among many others, which enforced racialized displacement across the country. The production of the film and its public circulation is as interesting to me as the visual content and script. The film was made with non-professional actors on two handheld cameras, with the reel smuggled out of the country. There was no formal script, and the outline was developed through a series of recorded conversations led by Nkosi and Modisane, with people from various walks of life and backgrounds in Johannesburg. And they have described this as a process of effectively talking the movie into being in their own words. Yet while the film was intended to show the violence of apartheid, it was also meant to speak to a period when underground music and cultural life in Johannesburg was, in the words of Nkosi, bursting the seams of apartheid. While Zachariah, the central character who we see here, is ultimately defeated, the overlapping possibili possibilities of political resistance, cosmopolitan creativity and pleasure were not. And it is this complexity of life that the film portrays so clearly, as spatialized, embodied and material. In the depiction of extreme preca precarity and violence, of that which was being lost, and yet always a sense of what might still be possible. These two films are two examples of layered and complex spatial archives on architecture, migration, and the city. Of a particular time in Johannesburg, Dakar, and Antibes. Of embodied engagements with spaces and cities, homes, homemaking, gender, and infrastructure, and so much more. They are architectural and urban critiques. They engage political commentary and offer ways of reading spatial practice. They also ask us to look again at the cities we inhabit, at the spaces we live in, at the world around us, at our archives and knowledge systems, at whose voices are included and those who are often left out. In working through the relationship between race and architecture in this curriculum, we are questioning the production of both. The framing around a set of verbs emphasizes that these processes are not fixed, but reproduce and actively maintained across space and across time. And so we acknowledge the importance of looking again, of caring to hear, of pausing to listen. In this curriculum, we are not aiming to recuperate architecture as a discipline. And even as we might read this work as architecture, as architects, the work is simultaneously a practice of displacing, stretching, disrupting, and reworking what architecture is and what it could be. And a practice of recognizing, recalling, and remembering. Remembering that in many parts of the world, in many projects, this work is always already happening. And so we look sideways to the silences, blind spots, to the things that move and astonish us, and to the possibilities inherent in poetics, hauntings, ghost stories, rumors, drawing and performing, as not quite architecture, as embodied and spatial and life-giving. And I want to end with a, a, a clip from, a second clip from Come Back Africa, 
and in the scene with Miriam Makeba. <laughs> Hey, don't keep us waiting. Space and Architecture is a project shared. It was shared with me by Huda and Susie, who brought me into the fold to think about how the curriculum that they had compiled could be developed, expanded and shared with the world. And in the process, we have gone on to share this project on and on with others, just some of whom I'm going to touch on here. But I want to start by talking about Sungura, which is a type of music that, depending on who you ask, originates in the Congo or Tanzania or Zimbabwe, as a Zimbabwean myself, I should probably stick to the party line, but I find something quite beautiful in the suggestion by Andrew Zore and others that it is instead a fusion of musical genres from the DRC, Kenya, Tanzania, South Africa, and even Cuba, which also has strands in traditional Zimbabwean genres in Mande, Jiti, Shangara, and Sukus. The story goes that this mix was facilitated by Zimbabwean liberation guerrillas who had trained to fight the white capitalist supremacy of colonialism in East Africa and returned to the country as combatants who had been exposed to a heady, conjoined mix of military training, class consciousness, and associated sonic registers of refusal and reimagining. I want to start by talking about Sungura. And you can't talk about Sungura without talking about Leonard Dembo and his band the Barura Express that gave us such hits as Chitekete, a 14-minute love song written by Dembo when he was a young boy heard in Kathleen Mashingo, or the big, big track Chinyemo released on the same album, which is a song written by a then-famous Dembo in 1991. Rangamberi, the writer and curator of the Sungura Central Platform and Archive, notes how this was a seismic moment for Sungura. The love song Chitekete was the biggest hit the country had ever seen, and Chinyamo, an incisive critique on the way capitalism crept in to corrupt the most ambitious parts of the Zimbabwean project of black liberation, reaching into people's homes, their places of work, 
and, in Dembo's words, taking the meat out of their children's pots of soup. In Chinyamu, Dembo sings about workers' struggles and about the harshness of life in Zimbabwe during ASAP, the economic and structural adjustment program imposed on the country by the World Bank and the IMF, a mechanism now more commonly understood north of the equator through the language of austerity. Kushanda and Dinoshanda, Asindinoshai wa Simba, sings Dembo. To work, I work, but I don't have power. I have no strength left. Ndisinungurewo, Dirangarirewo, release me and remember me. I wanted to start by talking about Sungura because you can't talk about Sungura without talking about Leonard Dembo. And once you're talking about Leonard Dembo, you're talking about love songs, by their very definition, a desire for a future together. And you're also talking about struggle songs at the same time. You're talking about the fullness of life and the desire to fight for it, and about the pressures which restrict, contort, and suppress that fullest flourishing. Across the border in DRC, we find another instance of this in the Sembene. Let's take the song Mario Nonstop by Franco and TPOK Jazz. <laughs> It is a relentless 14-minute track that appears to have no beginning and no end. I read somewhere that when Franco died, there was a traffic jam in Kinshasa that lasted for two months, and the radio played Mario non-stop for days. Franco was a master of the Sembene, a sound so synonymous with Congo, and composed of a hypnotic phrase that is played over and over again until it seeps into your bones. This was the music that taught Achille Mbembe an important lesson when he was writing the book on the post-colony. Mbembe writes, The emotional sublimity of the Congolese musical imagination taught me how indispensable it was to think with the bodily senses, to write with the musicality of one's own flesh. Indeed, in Africa, music has always been a celebration of the ineradicability of life, in a long, life-denying history. It is the genre that has historically expressed, in the most haunting way, our raging desire not only for existence, but more importantly for joy in existence, what we should call the practice of joy before death. Across the border yet again, when Zambia gained independence, the Kaunda government implemented some of the most radical policies of nationalization of land, infrastructure and minerals against the profit motive that we have ever seen on this planet. The Mulungushi project, a series of economic and social reforms would radically restructure relations between people, property and the earth. Through the abolition of private property and the nationalization of mines, the country's land and minerals were no longer matter for generating profit, but rather matter that had the means to enrich the lives and futures of the Zambian population. Among these policies was a new law that determined that at least 90% of music played on the radio had to be of Zambian origin with the objective of, quote, reawakening the public to cultural and social realities. Zambian musicians were encouraged into the studio and a new genre emerged, Zamrock, forged between studios in the mining areas of the Copper Belt and in the city in Lusaka, and played throughout the country. Norman Mntemba, vocalist and bass player in the Zamrock band Salty Dog, describes how, despite enormous social and economic challenges, the sound of Zamrock captured the optimism which people felt both for the country and concurrently for themselves too. To quote Muntemba, the good part was that with our independence, there was a renewed faith in the fact that this was a country that would go on and that we were a people who would go on. The music was just fantastic because it also helped us explore our sense of independence and our sense of reaching out. I wanted to start by talking about Sungura because you can't talk about Sungura without playing some Sungura, and then some Sembene, and then some Zamrock. And then it becomes immediately obvious that once you're talking about Sungura, you're no longer just talking, but you're listening, 
Your bones are vibrating at 130 BPM, 115 BPM, 120 BPM. Your heart starts pumping faster. Your pace of breath increases. You're dancing down to a molecular level and you're dancing together. What is this magic? That in the face of foreclosure and violence, forces which restrict the space one can occupy, the air one can breathe, and even the possibilities one can dare to dream, responds with a sound which conjures up the very opposite. Collective movement, which carries ideas, which rejects the cards we've been dealt, and which demands the very opposite. DJ Lene Denise speaks about the importance of black people moving together and moving in step as misery, resistance and sonic refusal. How black sound facilitates a shared space of rehearsal across time and geography, a space in which resistance to oppression can be tested, pressed in vinyl, on cassette tape, on MP3 circulated on a battered USB and then enacted generating a space in which it is possible to break free from oppressive forces entirely, a manoeuvre I have spoken about elsewhere as Black Flight. We're of course really here to talk about race space and architecture, and not Sungura, but I hope you will have already seen some resonance across the frequencies of both. I want to focus a bit on one part of the work which speaks to some of these ideas, though I think they are present across many parts of the work. I'm talking here in particular of collective movement and of the importance of sound and voice and maybe also about love. Race Space and Architecture is a project shared. Part of this is an acknowledgement that we are not the first nor the only to do this work and on the site a page of constellations links us to travelling companions in this work, some of whom are drawn from the quote-unquote discipline of architecture and many of whom are not like the boundaries between Sungura, Sembene and Zamrock. These borders are porous, artificial, colonially constructed, and where they exist, they exist to be dismantled. The imagery on race, space and architecture is the work of another collaborator in our constellation, the designer Fred Swart. This series of perfectly imperfect prints with smudges, finger marks, and which communicate the weight of the roller and the hand which pressed the print into being onto the page, disrupt the thin, glossy interface of the web. Within them, a series of figures, people engaged in acts of labour and life-making synonymous with Southern Africa, appear and disappear. At times they stand alone and sometimes together. They are in shifting landscapes which resist singular definition. For me, they are central to the platform reminding us that this is the cumulative work of many. All those authors, artists and contributors that you see on the page, but also all those for and with whom we work. The Sembene taught Mbembe about the indispensability of thinking with the bodily senses, of producing with the musicality of one's own flesh. Fred's prints are resonating at the same frequency. We have been fortunate to engage a number of phenomenal thinkers, Sarah Salem, Gloria Pavita, and we have a forthcoming piece from Tinashe Mushakavan, each of whom has engaged with the work of the platform, extending and adding to it from their own practice and research. In a series of ghost books, existing only on the glowing page of the screen, Sarah Salem reflects on personal and political histories of air travel, borders and surveillance. Beginning with an early memory of flying between Lusaka and Cairo, we travel with her through airports, waiting rooms, borders and circuitous routes as she unravels the workings of coloniality and capital from the vantage point of the sky. In a series of short films, Gloria Pavita explores the everyday spatial and material violence of immobility and waiting as a non-citizen in South Africa. In these films, we see and hear what it means to spend most of one's life waiting for citizenship or the right to belong. And finally, I'd like to hand over to the voices of others, which you will find in the sounding section on the platform. These are recordings made by others, which produce a thunderous chorus of voices of thinkers, architects, designers, academics, students, all engaging questions of race and space making through their work, with the ambition of constructing more just and equitable worlds into being. Here we are a movement, working against the profit motive as the driver of our existence. 
thinking with the bodily senses and the musicality of our flesh, practicing misery resistance and sonic refusal and collectively constructing a world otherwise. My name is Lauren Lowe Stewart. I am of Ghanaian descent and currently residing in London while completing my master's in architecture at the Royal College of Art. The following reading is an extract from Christina Sharp's In the Wake, in which Sharp observes positionality and events of black trauma, mortality and racial violence across multiple media types as an ongoing orthographic history ensuing in the wake of slavery. My name is Yana Blairford and I'll be reading There Ain't No Black in the Union Jack by Paul Gilroy. Chapter 5. Diaspora Utopia and the Critique of Capitalism, page 201 onwards. I will begin this segment with a question. What did I do with my experience of classroom rebellion over Mr. Johnson? Anyone familiar with the gossip in African literature may have heard that it was that book that made me decide to write. Home Place, a site of resistance. When I was a young girl, the journey across town to my grandmother's house was one of the most intriguing experiences. Mama did not like to stay there long. She did not care for all that loud talk. The talk that was usually about the old days, the way life happened then, who married whom, how and when somebody died, but also how we lived and survived as black people. My name is Tonda Maborake, and I'll be reading Migration Infrastructure by Biao Zhang, page 132 to page 133. It is not entirely new to conceptualize migration as a social process that organizes and channels mobility, rather than in terms of mobility per se. Migration cannot be described without the attention to necessary spatial infrastructural moorings that configure and enable mobilities. My name is Ajwa J, and I am reading an excerpt of A Small Place by Jamaica Kincaid. Have you ever wondered to yourself why it is that all people like me seem to have learned from you is how to imprison and murder each other? how to govern badly, and how to take the wealth of our country and place it in Swiss bank accounts? Have you ever wondered why it is that all we seem to have learned from you is how to corrupt our societies and how to be tyrants? You will have to accept that this is mostly your fault. Let me just show you how you looked at us. You came, you took things that were not yours, and you did not even, for appearances' sake, Ask first. I am going to read an excerpt from the book Borderlands, La Frontera, The New Mestiza, written by Gloria Ansaldúa. Chapter 7. La conciencia de la mestiza, towards a new consciousness. Por la mujer de mi raza hablará el espíritu. José Vasconcelos, Mexican philosopher, envisaged una raza mestiza una mezcla de razas afines, una raza de color, la primera raza síntesis del globo. He called it a cosmic race, la raza cósmica, a fifth race embracing the four major races of the world. Opposite to the theory of the pure Aryan and to the policy of racial purity that white America practices, his theory is one of inclusivity. At the confluence of two or more genetic streams with chromosomes constantly crossing over, this mixture of races, rather than resorting in an inferior being. Um, thank you to everybody who's made this event possible. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Thank you, Sandy, Susie, and Huda Tayo, um, for this incredible um, performance, screening, um, sounding. Um, so I, I have a feeling that there will be a lot of questions from the audience. Um, So I'll just start with a few questions of my own. Um, Maybe the the first question I have is really about time, actually. Um, And I mentioned this a little bit in my introduction. And at least for me, I I understand your project uh, or a race space in architecture as a product of a very particular time. Um, By that, I mean summer 2020. And now that we are approaching uh, summer 2022, a moment that a lot of people are considering to be a moment of retrenchment, uh, how do we begin to engage with some of these openings? 
um, you know, and some of these platforms that have been invented, uh, but also spaces that have been produced. Um, so I was wondering if you guys could reflect reflect on the last two years and how the project has transformed or will need to transform uh, in response to uh, our current political economy. Do you want me to call one of you or? <laughs> we Maybe we can just do it in the order of presentation or um, Susie, do you want to go first? Yeah, I mean, Emmanuel, the first thing to say, um, which might be stating the obvious, but I think it needs to be said, um, is that there's something fundamental about the organization of capital and the relentless pursuit of profit that translates into the organization of people and inevitably the, trans the, the organization of space. And I think, you know, the 20, um, the summer 2020 moment was not um, simply an, yet another demarcation of horrific death um, and a kind of reimagining of, of life giving prospects through, through the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, it was also a period in which the relentless pursuit of profit and the endless organization of people as surplus um, seems to, to be expanding in ways that are kind of beyond our, our reach. So, you know, we're, we're, we're living in a crisis at the moment where, as I'm sure you probably are in the States, where people have to choose whether they can turn up their heating or whether they can feed their families. Um, you know, I've seen academics sitting in a meeting with layers and layers of 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 clothing on because they can't afford to pay their heating. Um, and so I think I think that we do live and I and I like the words that 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 Tandy employs. We 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 live with a kind of resonance of certain acute moments that allow us to sit up and take stock. But I think we should also be mindful of a, of a much longer frequency of dispossession that we have to always attend to. Um, while I think the, the summer of 2020 was absolutely vital for us, particularly who've come from a, a, a southern orientation, you know, the 2015 moment was also vital to see the kind of um, uprisings through the fees must fall which brought as many people out onto the streets as had come out onto the street to protest against apartheid. And so how do we imagine that energy and investment on the streets and how do we translate that into learning differently and how do we translate it into making space differently? Um, and I think we have to start with our own patch. I think the, the university is, is not up to scratch, so we might we might read things at the start of presentations to do with university commitments, but we also know that universities actively displace people uh, in Harlem, in London, um, etc. So we can't have the conversations about our education as if that is separate from the casualization of the people who are working in universities or the ever increasing expanse of the university, which is also tied to the profit motive. Um, and so how, how do we literally start with our own patch? How do we work within a university, teach students, fight against casualization, fight against displacement? I think these things are inevitably um, interlinked. And I think that's what we learn from the summer of 2020. These are not isolated incidents. They are inextricably linked, which means that the imagination of architecture has to inevitably li be linked to things within and beyond architecture. Um, yeah, thanks, uh, Emmanuel and Susie. Um, I guess, uh, I guess maybe to add, I mean, I think I would, I would echo everything that Susie said, but I think also even in, in the kinds of references that we include or things that we speak to, 
I think one of the things that's really important in how we've how we're putting together the curriculum and growing it is to recognize the long history of work that's been done both within academic environments but also beyond it so I think there's a lot of um, I think it can be get, it can be quite easy to get caught up in the moment uh, and focus on the kinds of conversations that are happening but I think with I mean certainly for me like uh, being I guess officially trained as an architectural historian um, the if I think about the kinds of films that I spoke about today, Le Noir Deux or Come Back Africa, I think so many of those conversations are, even though they speak to a very different time and, and particular moments, are things that are very present with us. And so it, it's really important to think through this longer history and the work that has been done. And I think the same could be said so for, for so much of what we think of as absent or we're, we're told is absent in um, I think whether it's through in academic terms when the kinds of theories we're engaging with we're actually we're talking about what is made absent and what is made um what is yeah what is removed so i think there's there's so many ways to respond to your question um and i i do think of course you know things are changing and the COVID pandemic has really made visible some of the present brutalities in, in so many parts of the world but but also these are these have long histories and um, I think it's important to remember that. I have the very unenviable task of following two giants, <laughs> three giants even. <laughs> um, so I would of course echo everything that has been said. <laughs> Um, and I would perhaps, yeah, maybe to, to resonate a bit more on some of those aspects. Um, I, I agree, I think we are in a period of retrenchment um, and that's, that's quite scary, but it also means that we have to take very seriously um, both the struggle at hand, as you were saying, but also the, the ground that has been gained and the gains that we've made over the last few years and to really um, think and work very seriously with that. Um, so, for example, um, uh, Colombia was very uh, understanding and uh, rightly so, very uh, accommodating in us shifting the date of this of this lecture because of the incredible labor action that was happening at Colombia when we were originally supposed to do this talk. And then the incredible labor action that is happening at the UK. And as Susie said, we can't decouple that work from the, from this work rather from the actual work that's happening in our, in our um, on our doorstep um, in various contexts and, and to understand the, the kind of um, co-connectedness and complicities of that. So um, for, for those of us on the call, students, members of the academic community, and I include in that a very broad spectrum of the academic community, um, we've got to think these, these questions very, very seriously in terms of our immediate environment. And then I think we have to also take very seriously the ground that has been gained. So when I was an undergraduate, the idea that Miriam Makeba could be played in an architectural <laughs> international lecture, and we'd have to take that seriously as we should, because she is a genius, <laughs> in terms of a provocation for rethinking um, both the discipline, but also architectural thought, that's just unheard of. So, I mean, we've got to really make the most of this space and really work with it and, and enjoy it. I think one thing that I, I wasn't expecting, but I'm so glad, and I, knowing us, I think it makes sense, is how much each of our um, talks really touched a lot on violence, but also touched on uh, the ineradicability of life and on um, the incredible amount of joy that is found in these archives and in this material that we're working with. And so um, I think we have to really take seriously the injunction to enjoy the work that we're doing. Yes, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> maybe following up on that a little bit, um, there was a point in your presentation, Huda, where uh, you said, uh, this is not a project that tries to recuperate architecture. And, and I loved that moment because I think the, the kind of fundamental misinterpretation uh, of race, space and architecture would be that you guys are identifying new territories for the discipline, right? And identifying these new territories would somehow rescue or rec recuperate uh, the discipline. And, and, I, and I really appreciate that moment of refusal. And it also made me think a lot about 
um, at the very end, uh, Thandi, when you were talking about uh, citizenship and uh, fighting for the right to belong. And I think for folks who have been thinking about these issues uh, within architecture, it has really been that, right? Like it's basically an attempt or a fight to try to belong within a discipline that uh, repeatedly tells you that those, those ideas and those concerns are not uh, relevant, right? Um, so, so I guess maybe in a way merging those two, uh, would it be fair to say that race, space and architecture is explicitly interested in the things that architecture is not? Like how, how do you guys think about this, this question of recuperation? Um, I know two of you have very direct relationships <laughs> to the discipline at least. Um, and, you know, I, I was also thinking about this a lot when uh, Sandy, you were, you were talking about the Ashil and Dembe quote, um, to write with the musicality of one's own flesh. And I think a lot of these bodily experiences are very difficult to, to engage with within the realms of architecture or architectural discourse. Um, so I guess I, I'm just curious to hear how the curriculum begins to accommodate that. Uh, is it fundamentally about maintaining uh, this contradiction uh, and making sure that we continue to grapple with, uh, with the failures and limits of the discipline? Um, or, or is it about identifying uh, these, these moments of porosity uh, or overlap, et cetera? Maybe I can start so we change the order slightly. Um, and, and I'm sure, um, I mean, we actually were all trained as architects, all three of us, and I'm sure we also have slightly different responses to this. Um, I think, you know, for me and I think it's a kind of, um, I'm not sure it's so much a kind of a contradiction, but I think it's an acknowledgement of both not, not, not claiming to recuperate architecture is to recognize the violence that architecture does and to acknowledge it and to not want to, um, and, and to not want to kind of try and save it from that, from this place that is deeply problematic and both, I think in so many ways, when we, whether we talk about um, labor processes or relationships of history, relationships of knowledge production um, or materiality and climate. I think there's, there's many layers of the kinds of violence. But I think it's not, for me, it's not about, the curriculum is not, um, is not about the things that are not architecture because I think what, what, I, what I also think that we, we need to acknowledge is that while the discipline might hold in certain centers and in certain ways, it is always something else somewhere else. And, and so I think that, and, and I, I think for me, like teaching in South Africa, it's, it's, it's something that I'm always, um, that I was very much confronted with directly was, you know, we speak, you can, you, yeah, there's a lot of speak about decolonizing the discipline in the North, but it actually is something very different if you study it somewhere else in the world and, and sometimes even in the global North, you know, because there's different ways of understanding what architecture is. And so I think, yeah, I, I, that, that would be my response that it, it's a kind of, you know, how do we acknowledge that, that come back Africa is architecture, that Maria Makeba's work, I mean, you know, her history, is, is an incredible, is incredibly spatial, tells us about so many things from the house that she was actively involved in to, you know, her travels and voyages and, um, and, and really making of worlds. Um, yeah. So I, I, I had one of the most extraordinary privileges as, a, as an architectural practitioner in the sense that um, I was at Fitz University in the height of apartheid. And when I graduated, uh, I graduated into uh, the post-apartheid democracy. And we set up a small practice in Cape Town with a group of women. And um, 
received extraordinary commissions from the state, really about reimagining what constitutes public life, what constitutes spaces of learning. Um, and I, I have to say that for me, this thing of watching a building come out of the ground is uh, phenomenally exciting because no matter how much you've drawn it, no matter how much you've, time you spent on every detail, you cannot anticipate the way in which that building is going to emerge. But something that became really, uh, it became so apparent in, in, in making spaces um, in places where people had very little by way of formal state investment was that the building is a repertoire or a compendium of many things. It's bricks and mortar. It's um, how people are going to maintain that building without resources. It's a kind of political economy of who's building it and who's getting paid properly or not getting paid. It's the politics of who gets to inhabit that building in a certain way. And so I think one of the things that we don't do enough of in schools is just acknowledge that a building is in fact a compendium and we spend so much time educating people on the details of the bricks and mortar and not on the anthropological exercise of looking at practices or on any kind of recognition of just very basic political economies that allow these buildings to to flourish or, or diminish. Um, and so yeah, I just think we can think about this thing that we call building or architecture as, as far more multifaceted than we do. I think we reduce it um, when we reduce it to bricks and mortar. Yeah, maybe if I could just add there, um, I was very fortunate to drop into Emmanuel's, one of Emmanuel's classes this afternoon and um, Herman uh, Beckett came up, who had actually dragged me to the inter, uh, the, the UCL section of UCL and said, you've got you to see this person speak. <laughs> and they were brilliant, and I've been speaking about them ever since. And he said many things that were very profound, but one of them that he said was around um, one of the functions of racism and the way race works in relation to epistemology, uh, or, or whiteness works, let me put it that way. And one of the functions or the ways in which it works is to reduce uh, non-white registers to um, a discussion around evidencing value and existence. So we're constantly saying there is more and we are here and this is what we do. <laughs> um, and, and rather than actually being able to get to a depth of what is happening in those non-white um, registers and what, how does it work and what does it offer us? <laughs> and, um, really understanding these long histories that Huda is speaking about. Um, so for me, I'm less interested in questions of what is and isn't architecture. And I think that's a pitfall that maybe we've got to be careful of, because um, I think it's operating as a distraction in, in possibly many of the similar ways. And rather be asking questions of, um, which I think, or well, I would hope the platform is doing, and I think certainly the commission pieces and the soundings and the engagements with it are, um, are working in this realm which is what happens when we engage a fuller range of epistemologies and sites and practices and what are the, what emerges as a result of that? What, what does that offer architecture? How does that expand our, expand our worlds as, as Susie's saying? Um, and I'm, I'm, I would really encourage everyone to spend some time on that SoundCloud link because those are recordings of students that are engaging this material and producing architectural projects seriously architectural projects as a result um, and, and doing that work of really taking this this seriously. Yeah, um, thank you for these responses. I was mostly trying to be somewhat provocative. Um, and, you know, I'll, I'll just offer some background in the fact that um, <clears throat> I would say there's been there's been some debate debates um, here in the US, especially uh, from architectural historians, uh, claiming that uh, it is in a way impossible to disentangle architecture from whiteness. Um, and therefore, I think, at least when, when I was involved in a recent exhibition <laughs> around blackness, we, we made it a point to not talk about it as architecture. So everything became about spatial practices. And obviously that has its own limits, uh, but, but it was kind of uh, 
allowing us to enter into realms where we can speak about these other disciplines and aesthetic practices that might never migrate over to the territory uh, of architecture. And I think at least what I get from the responses that you guys gave me is that you were interested in engaging with these spaces uh, and whether that produces architecture or not uh, is, is a different issue, maybe. Is that, is that fair? Maybe again to disrupt the order. <laughs> um, that's that's a pos certainly probably another question that we'll probably have different responses to. <laughs> um, but I think maybe it's worth coming back to some of the kind of key framing questions that Hood and Susie um, developed, which I think are so helpful. And I think there's multiple realms where this work has influence and, and one of them is certainly in the practice of architecture and, and as I say I think you see that in the kinds of work students are producing which um, would which would uh, rile up certain groups <laughs> who might want to defend particular notions of architecture um, but there's also something else that is happening there which is around how knowledge is being produced um, what what terms of reference as Huda was mentioning, what archives can be brought into that space of knowledge production. Um, and so the material of what of what knowledge production, what constitutes knowledge for the further production of, of knowledge and architecture. Um, but then also the terms through which it's being done. And I think um, that was that was super powerful. And what Susie was saying in the opener is um, I think we also need to look at the economic systems under which we're producing the relationships that are being um, construct conscribed and con constructed within that and what that says about how we practice to uh, where architects are situated within this economy of spatial production be it knowledge be it built be it you know in a, a huge spectrum so I think um, I think there's many many realms in which there's potential for this work to influence our thinking of architecture quite broadly um, and productively. Um, I'm not quite sure if I'm committed to this as an idea, but I think it's a, it's a, it's just a, a thing to think through. I think not all spatial practices are imaginative practices. And I think there is something incredibly important about both the disciplining and undisciplining of architecture um, that asks us to hold on to this thing that we call imagination. Um, this pursuit of trying to think or feel uh, a world otherwise. And I think it's something that's quintessentially beautiful and important to the idea of 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 of, of architecture architecture broadly construed um, I no longer practice explicitly as an architect I work in a social sciences school and I work in a sociology department and it, it is quite interesting to me to see how students that come from different disciplinary backgrounds engage with problems uh, or engage with possibilities and you know conventionally the sociologist will attend to the question of what is and they'll attend to that question really imaginatively but they don't necessarily begin with the question of what could be and so i think there is something that we need to extend in into that vocabulary of spatial practices around the possibilities um, that imaginations yield Um, um, I wonder if there's anything to add, um, but I think, I mean, maybe, I mean, I think in some ways your question is a really complex question because you're kind of asking what is a discipline in the first place. And I guess, I guess what I, what I was sort of trying to say to 10 to 2 in Cape Town um, is that I think it does, I think any discipline is always what it is within its boundaries, but always something else because it's always living in the world in a, in a particular way. And, and I think through, um, and I think 
I think this is true for architecture, but also other disciplines. So some of the work that I've been reading recently on questions around history and what the, and how, you know, how is history different from fiction and where, the, where are those lines drawn and how are they drawn? And I think the argument from a lot of critical scholars um, and, you know, someone like Michel um, Trio, for instance, is that it's, it's through the production of power that we understand the distinction between history and fiction. And, and so I think, but I think a similar argument could be made about architecture. So we, so it's so it's not a clear cut answer of saying, well, you know, do we just leave it behind? Because I think, I think when you leave it behind, you leave all of those practices behind that have never, have never obeyed the discipline, but have used the naming, used the words, um, and sometimes you know, language itself is slippery and it's messy, and it's also. Sometimes people use architecture to mean something else, but that in itself can be a disruptive practice. So I think even, even at a, um, in a disciplinary sense or in thinking about knowledge frameworks, I think that, there, that to, to think of architecture as inherently white is, it's important to understand what it is within boundaries, but also to not recognize that it's also always been something else or for many people around the world um, and i think you know post-colonial theory has really kind of taught us this is, is is to silence those other histories it's to silence the people who've been doing this kind of work um, that that is really important um, and that i think we're all very much inspired by No, absolutely. Thank you for those um, responses. Uh, one, one more question I will ask, and we're, we're going to open it up to uh, the audience shortly, but um, I, I noticed that Black quantum futurism is uh, one of uh, the references in, in uh, your list. And um, I was really interested in the non-linearity of the narratives that all three of you have engaged in, at least this evening. And um, I'm particularly fascinated with this moment of optimism, uh, post-independence optimism. Um, and I think throughout the continent, all of us have some images that we associate with that moment. And somehow the retel retelling of that moment also affects the way we understand the present. Um, so I wonder if you guys can speak a little bit more about time and nonlinearity as it relates to the curriculum. Okay. <laughs> Um, thank you for this question. Um, I think I think it comes back to what I what I might say comes back to a, a point that has um, already been made in some in some respects, which is that these these struggles are, have really long histories, right? Um, uh, and I think. It's very telling as well that when you know when we talk about decolonization, there's often some um, uh, members of the conversation that are very disgruntled by the fact that this conversation is happening at all because it's already happened. <laughs> and I think that um, part of our work should, of course, be to to acknowledge that, but also to situate this work very much. So to do perhaps two things, which is to situate this work very much in this moment in terms of what are the struggles that we're contending with. And what does the, the nature of that struggle look like and what are the tools that we need in order to contend with it um, but also not to be bound by this moment and not to be defined by this moment so to to i always try to think of it as unspent fuel so to look at what what remains to be ignited from what has been or what is yet to come or what has been projected as yet to come but hasn't been realized um, that we can engage with that we can use to to inspire to fuel to support our work um, and in order to to combat that kind of 
reduction or re retrenchment, I think was your word, into um, the, the immediacy of the present moment, right? So that we hold on to that imaginative capacity of, of going beyond it. Um, I think Lene Denise speaks of it as misery resistance, which I find particularly great. Um, like we resist that misery and, and we instead craft and create in a space of otherwise. Um, and I would, I would hope that the, that the curriculum is inspiring that and is, and is perhaps modeling some of that in its, in its performance. I also think um, I, I really like this gesture. You mentioned it in the introduction and again now, Emmanuel, of non-linearity. Non and of course, that's not simply temporal, it's explicitly spatial. And um, I'm thinking of a piece of work we did where we, we traced the journeys of migrant proprietors to streets in the UK. And it's, it's a tracing of, of racial borders because for certain people to move, not only will it take them 10, 10 years to say, get from Sudan to Birmingham, but the routes are actually really contorted and zigzagged. And so in this contortion and zigzagging, they acquire this kind of peculiar reconstituted cosmopolitan repertoire of here and elsewhere of near and far um, that entirely shapes their imagination for how they then set up shop. And I think the same holds for us, uh, again, the three of us who have crisscrossed the globe, lived in different places, um, it would be impossible to say that we belong to any one sphere. And so when you're thinking about how to teach or where to draw an example from, or what constitutes a memory, you're weaving in this nonlinear accumulation of things. And that's part of the joy as well, um, is the kind of the labyrinth um, that is always not not only temporal but always spatial. Um, thanks, uh, Emmanuel. I think, yeah, I think the I think the importance of nonlinearity is kind of present throughout um, the curriculum, but I think. For me, something that I'm working on at the moment, which I think is very present, is the idea of thinking or working through ghost ghost stories and um, architectural ghost stories. And I know there's been a lot of recent work, um, but I'm particularly, uh, yeah, I'm particularly kind of thinking about actually some of Sarah Salem's work, who's a colleague and collaborator. And she speaks really eloquently about the kind of the haunting of these possibilities of the of this moment of decolonization in Egypt and of the possibilities of you know what Nasser promised. And I think as you point out, you know, so many of us live with the have lived with the failures, but also with that moment of hope that somehow still kind of it's it stays in our present. It's something we hear through the news, in songs, in protests and um, this kind of recurrence that is part of life um, and then I think and some of the ghost stories I'm looking at have a much longer history but so pre-modern um, but are but are these stories in spaces about materials that I think really remind us of uh, for me not just I mean it's not just about you know remembering or thinking about optimism but I think also that there are other ways of in that of, of thinking the world um, and other kinds of epistemological frameworks which are not about linearity and progress and especially in a context where all of this promised progress has, has not really um, materialized for so many in, in most cases um, i think other kinds of temporal frameworks as they already exist are really are really a kind of, I guess, a, a way of searching for, for something else um, as much as a possible future, also that, that other possible past. Yeah, if I might just add a bit to that, I, I think that's such a beautiful point. And one thing that I've noticed over the last few years um, with a group of students um, that I've 
been fortunate to work with at the RCA is how this fascinating um, uh, way of working or, or occurrence that has happened, um, which is that in, in trying to engage projects around climate catastrophe and climate crisis, they've been, um, they've realized that uh, that part of the uh, issue, uh, certainly a huge part of the issue, is that, it, that this um, economic and social system that has led to this is rooted in a particular epistemology, right? And so, so often these questions around how do we think um, about future trajectories for the planet are often coupled with where do we look for those other epistemologies? And so um, from a vantage point of thinking about climate crisis, often these students also end up thinking about race, indigeneity, um, other epistemologies, broadening their canon. And so I think there's so many entry points into this work, which um, I'm realizing that we perhaps don't acknowledge enough. And often questions of race, certainly within architecture schools and tend to get siloed into projects around identity um placenessness or situatedness but actually these are these are much much bigger and broader questions which with much larger resonance and can be really fruitful and promising in that way no absolutely um thank you all for those beautiful responses there there is one question from the audience by the way if anyone in the audience wants to ask questions feel free to use the chat um I will somewhat paraphrase this question because I think you guys have responded to versions of it. Um, but the question is, how uh, have you navigated the need for epistemic and disciplinary disobedience through slash in your research? And how has that permeated the curriculum? Um, I mean, I would love to pretend that it's through some kind of rational consciousness that I've planned and plotted and resolved. I have to admit, it's it's usually serendipitous and by accident. Um, you know, I started the story tonight of how our curriculum began. We didn't know we were going to make a curriculum. We were going down another path and a curriculum emerged. Similarly, in research, um, I, I don't have kind of any conscious epistemic challenge that I set myself. I just think the best thing you can do is go to a place and walk and talk and listen and hang about. Um, you know, something as straightforward as that is to be human with other humans um, and to encounter other forms of life alongside that it's it's sometimes as simple as 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 that and as complicated as that um yeah i, I thanks Maria. hi maria it's nice to see you <laughs> um i i think there's two things that are, that come to mind with this question which is um i love that this is something that you were asked in Colombia, and I think I would be so interested in further conversation around how we navigate these questions differently in different contexts, what, what emerge, because um, I, I think we tend to talk about it as if there is this one kind of global hegemonic academic system, <laughs> but we know that it, it has lots of particularities, and so it's so fruitful to hear that these conversations are happening. Um, and then the other thing I was going to talk about was uh, Danny Navajera talks about combative um, methodologies. And, um, and I, I think that's something that we're certainly not shying away from. So the, the language, the imagery, ambition behind race, space and architecture is really, uh, we're, we're up for causing a bit of ruckus. <laughs> and I think, um, uh, yeah, I think we can't be polite. We can't shy away at the moment. We've got to really take these questions on with vigor. And so, I, yeah, just that point about disobedience um, really resonated with that, that idea of the combative as a methodology, as a research position. Um, so one more question by um, Shaman Rubari. Um, he wrote, can't, can't thank you all enough uh, for your powerful work. I'm reading Frank Wilderson III's Afro-Pessimism. 
It's helping me to rethink the productive power of theorizing space, uh, spaces of whiteness versus racism versus anti-Black racism. Uh, how do you see the relevance of these distinctions to your project? I think this may be representative of <laughs> the various time zones that we're in. <laughs> um, I think there's something very interesting, actually, and, and maybe it comes back to our, our um, situatedness, which is also one of the kind of opening statements of, of the platform. and. Uh, I would say that certainly in my own work, and, and I think I see this as well in the curriculum, we are, we are all uh, originating from Southern Africa. And I think a lot of our um, theoretical um, underpinnings uh, tend to be grounded by that site as, as a context. Um, and, and I think there's very different discussions around racism and brown whiteness happening in, in, in that context versus in the states um, and so I would say I think that the work is more is more grounded by that kind of that kind of um, body of thought um, but it would be really interesting to hear from others actually and please write to us tell us how you're working with the work <laughs> working with it engaging with it and where you perhaps see um, uh, productive gaps <laughs> uh, or space for elasticity for other kind of worlds of thought to come in. Just to say, I, th I think that's an extraordinary question. I don't have the confidence to answer it, but I would like to go away and think about it. So yeah, you're welcome to drop us a line. I really would like to think about that more. Thank you for that question. Yes, same. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I, I'm, I'm curious about uh, Shaolin. Uh, hopefully we can talk about this later as well. Um, but there have been some conversations around Afro-pessimism in the context of architecture. And to me, what's interesting is um, even Frank Wilderson would say it's primarily a diagnosis of our current condition. So it's hard, obviously, to engage with Afro-pessimism when we're thinking projectively. Um, and yeah, I'll be really curious to hear your thoughts. Unfortunately, the webinar, I guess, is set up so you can't jump in and, and tell us what you're thinking. but. We'll, we'll find other platforms. Um, I, I want to be respectful of how late it is for you guys <laughs> right now. And thank you so, so much. This has been incredible. Um, I've learned a great deal and I'll keep revisiting these references. And um, just thank you for opening up this space and this, uh, this open curriculum. And I think it's something that a lot of people will continue to revisit and hopefully contribute to. Um, yeah, thank you all. Thank you, Emmanuel. Thanks for this very generous, very close engagement with it. It's such an honor to, to have you especially engage with it. So thank you so much. Yeah. yeah, thank you. It's been amazing to hear some of your thoughts and and incredible questions that I think are, um, yeah, need a longer conversation. Yeah, huge, huge thanks. And please help us think through this question of what to do next with the curriculum. We would welcome your responses. Thank you. And thanks, Emmanuel. Absolutely.